All right, so here we go. We're going to do a little uh, video lecture on salt hydrolysis, equivalence, normality, and a couple other topics uh, that lead us into the final stages of this unit. So uh, we've already done our phenothaline challenge, and we've done our titration stuff, so now it's time to add a little bit more information to that. So we're going to start with some, a term called equivalence. Now, in the world of chemistry, an equivalent means equal to something else. So when you actually start looking at your different acids and how they work, um, the amount of acid that will donate one mole of hydrogen ions basically is what we're talking about here. So if you take a look, you have a mole of hydrochloric acid provides one equivalent of H+. Uh, a mole of, of sulfuric acid provides two equivalents of H+. So you're looking at your ratios. And we've been talking about ratios already in here in terms of monoprotic versus diaprotic versus triprotic. Um, but when you measure concentration of different acids, it's useful to sometimes measure based off of equivalence instead of based off of the original acid that was put into solution. So um, we're going to use this to actually generate a different way of forming a concentration called normality instead of molarity, which we are used to using. So um, basically an equivalent is just your ratio between um, your diprotic acid to how many hydrogen ions are there. You can also apply this to bases, okay? Um, so for example, moles worth of calcium hydroxide gives us two equivalents of uh, hydroxide ions to that also. So basically you're looking for that subscript two, three, or two here for your different equivalents. Now working with uh, another form of concentration, we've done molarity, we've done molality, and now we have normality, okay? Um, so one more way of doing concentration and normality is based off of equivalence. So it's your equivalence of solute versus liters of solution. Um, normality is used only in acid-based chemistry. Uh, I've never seen it used anywhere besides acid-based chemistry because we're really talking about those H plus ions versus liters of your solution. Okay. Um, what's nice about it is if you have more than one type of acid, if you have sulfuric, nitric, hydrochloric acid, and you're trying to determine which one is the most concentrated or which one would have the highest or lowest pH, if you measure in normality or equivalence, uh, you can compare apples to apples because the concentration of sulfuric acid uh, in normality would be the same as hydrochloric acid by the same hydrogen ions there. Um, now, in terms of those calculations, the way you actually can figure it out back to more molarity if you need to convert between the two. If you have a monoprotic acid, your molarity equals your normality. Okay, So for hydrochloric acid, anytime you see normality and molarity, they would mean the same thing. Uh, they could be interchangeable because hydrochloric acid is a monoprotic acid or a single hydrogen ion. Diprotic acids such as sulfuric acid, so H2SO4 is our best example for this one, um, two times your molarity will give you your normality. Okay, so if you had two molar sulfuric acid, um, you'd have four normal sulfuric acid or four, four normality in terms of that. So you take your molarity times two will give you your normality. If you have a triprotic acid, uh, probably best example there would be phosphoric acid, H3PO4. If you had, let's say, two molar phosphoric acid, you'd have six normal phosphoric acid in terms of doing those calculations. So it's just another way of representing concentration and instead of worrying about the type of acid you have, when you do it in normality, it really focuses on those H plus ions. So it doesn't matter which acid you have, they all can be worked and kind of seen as the same in terms of our normalities. We're going to start talk, moving on to something called salt hydrolysis. Okay, Or basically, how does the salts that get produced in our neutralization reactions affect the overall pH of our solution? Um, we talked before that the salts, um, that when you do a neutralization reaction, you actually get a salt and you get uh, water from that neutralization reaction. Now, those salts that are formed sometimes can act as acids or bases. So sometimes they have enough strength in terms of their Ka values and Kb values to actually add as, as an acid or a base. So basically what we're saying is if you use a weak acid or a weak base to try to neutralize a strong acid or a strong base, uh, the result is your salt actually is either a base or an acid. So it affects your equilibrium. Um, the result overall is 
that neutralization we talked about the other day um, does not end up neutral. So you actually, when you get to the equivalent point or that end point, you don't get a pH of 7. You get a pH that's either above or below 7. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. If you take a weak acid with a strong base, so in this case we have a weak acid and we have a strong base, and we're going to put them together to neutralize them. Okay. Uh, so here's our example. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base. This is acetic acid, which is our number is vinegar, basically. That is our weak acid. When these two react with each other, we make our water, and we make the salt sodium acetate. Okay, So sodium acetate is our salt. It's in solution, so we're going to write it as separate ions here. But the problem is the sodium comes from a strong base. So it's... KB or KA value is going to be very, very, very tiny. It's going to be basically times 10 to the negative 10th or smaller. So that value will have no bearing on the equilibrium. But the acetate ion, its KB value actually does have an effect here. Okay, So it actually acts a little bit like a base in solution. So if you look, the salt then can hydrolyze. Okay, with water, so we call it salt hydrolysis. Okay, it can hydrolyze with water in the following reaction. So here's your acetate ion. It can react with water, and we produce a little bit more acetic acid back, and then some hydroxide ions. So what happens is, if you look at these conjugate pairs, this is reacting with water. It's gaining a hydrogen or gaining a proton, so it's acting as a base, the water is forced to lose a hydrogen, so it's acting as an acid. And the overall result is to make some more hydroxide ions. Well, if we add more hydroxide ions into solution, um, we're going to shift our equilibrium up past a neutral point. Okay? Okay, so whenever you have a weak acid plus a strong base, that weak acid, its conjugate actually ends up acting as a base which then forces the reaction to shift, and we end up getting basic overall. So if you have a weak acid reacting with a strong base, what I'd probably add into our notes here is that weak acid with strong base always equals a pH of greater than 7. Okay, So that combination will always give you a pH that is larger than 7 or is basic overall when those two are mixed. So let's switch the scenario now, and let's have a weak base with a strong acid. Okay, so here we have uh, ammonia, which is our weak base, and we have hydrochloric acid, which is our strong acid. The two react together, and when they do, we get the ammonium ion plus the chlorine ion. Okay, uh, in this case, uh, we're not showing the water as part of this reaction. Uh, you could show the water in here, um, but then we have to deal with hydronium ions, and we have to deal with uh, some other things that are just kind of makes it mucks it up. So right now I'm excluding the water, so we're not showing that part of this reaction as we do this. We're only showing the, the base plus the acid uh, part here. So the strong acid, its conjugate base, the chlorine ion, has no bearing. It's going to do nothing because it's too weak. The weak base, its conjugate, the ammonia, sorry, ammonium ion, is actually a relatively strong acid. So it actually is going to have an effect on our equilibrium. So that ammonium ion will then react with water. And when it reacts with water, it goes back and makes some more ammonia, which shifts our equilibrium, and it produces this hydronium ion that we've talked about a little bit in class. Well, the hydronium ion is the same thing as producing hydrogen ions. So essentially, when you have a weak base with a strong acid, the result is you actually produce more acid from that equilibrium, and it shifts your pH again. So for the salt hydrolysis, in this scenario, we're donating H plus ions, making the solution acidic overall. Okay, so again, for no purposes, weak base plus a strong acid, the result would be a pH of less than 7. Okay, so we always get a less than 7 because the conjugate formed from the weak base actually can generate more acid, and we end up getting acidic overall for that. Okay. So when you do titration experiments, if you're not titrating a strong base with a strong acid and you titrate a weak with a strong, 
your end point may not land at 7, so you need to choose a different indicator to find that end point. Um, that brings us to this idea of buffers and how buffers work. So um, essentially, as we talk more about buffers, we're going to be going back to the shot liaise principle and looking at this idea behind how do buffers work and how does the shot the H principle again uh, dictate what goes on inside these equilibriums of our weak bases with their conjugates and our weak acids with their conjugates okay so we're gonna stop here today I'm not gonna do any more for the video lecture uh, we will start on Monday looking at uh, some lab stuff and then also going into buffers following that um, the rest of the week. So the last part of the week is all buffer stuff and how they work. And then we do our test after Memorial Weekend. Okay, guys, uh, we are done. Thank you for your time.